United Nations peacekeepers work in difficult and dangerous environments all around the world, risking their lives to protect the most vulnerable people. But vulnerable people speak many different languages, sometimes obscure ones, and they can be suspicious of these strange foreigners. So how on earth can peacekeepers communicate with the ball? Let's find out. In 1988, the Nobel Peace Prize went to an unlikely recipient, a military force. Who would have thought? But it all started with something a few decades earlier. The first UN peacekeeping mission was deployed to the Middle East in 1948, where military observers serving with the United Nations Truth Supervision Organization continue to work today to help bring stability to the region. While originally peacekeeping forces were established to do just that, keep the peace after a ceasefire or resolution was established in international conflict. And if you're unarmed in these hostile situations, the one thing that can keep you alive is your ability to talk your way out of it. And peacekeepers don't fight in wars, but they do have to keep mercenaries out of the country. So at some point during the 1950s and 60s, they had to be armed. But here's the thing, armed or not, if peacekeepers can't communicate clearly with the ones they're meant to be helping, there can easily be misunderstandings and then mistrust, closely followed by trouble with the capital T. And if you're wondering about these awesome blue hats, well, that's all part of the story. These women and men operate in increasingly dangerous operational environments, risking their lives each day in the pursuit of peace. So what is peacekeeping exactly? Well, it's operated by the United Nations, and it's a unique force of people who go on missions to protect vulnerable communities against attacks to help make sure humanitarian aid arrives safely and a whole lot more. The main aim is to help countries transition from conflict to peace, and there are 12 of these missions going on right now. The most common sort of peacekeeper is an infantry soldier, but they can also be soldiers who are engineers, helicopter crew, transporters, medics, communicators, sometimes they're in the police or even civilian volunteers. And then you get the guys stationed at headquarters. But the one thing they all need, you got it, it's languages. Of course, the role of the peacekeeper is only one job you can do here. The UN is actually the world's largest employer of translators, interpreters, editors, verbatim reporters, and other language experts. I spoke about the interpreters in another video. Quite a mind-bending job, that one. But a peacekeeper is the only one who gets to wear one of these. The Blue Helmets, an entire international army, a multinational force whose main objective is to preserve peace in the most dangerous, violent, and unstable places around the globe. Next time you hear the name Blue Helmets, remember, they're talking about peacekeepers. A peacekeeper is usually in the military, but as long as they're wearing the light blue helmet, they are not trying to be camouflaged because they're on a peace mission. If they're wearing a blue beret or a blue cap, same thing. Anyway, a UN peacekeeper gets assigned as a kind of observer in a conflict zone. They monitor and protect borders, for example, and if two unfriendly sides have a ceasefire meeting, the peacekeepers will take notes and report any violations. But most missions are humanitarian, which is tricky when you look like a soldier. Think about this. You are a villager in Africa and there's trouble all around you. Some soldiers show up and you don't know what they want. What do you do? Why should you trust them? Troops mount regular patrols in the region around Kamua. The FTLR are everywhere. How about if the soldiers look like you and speak your language? Well, now it's a different picture because you can at least talk to them. So this is why they need peacekeepers who understand local languages. Problem is, the soldiers are usually not local and there are so many regional languages. It's especially true in Africa where most of the missions are based. A lot of local people also speak French or Swahili, but if the peacekeepers can't even speak French, well, even villagers can get unfriendly. One of the other problems is when hostile groups spread bad information. Another challenge is whenever we go into a village and the people are too scared to, to talk to us and give us information, obviously we don't want to put anyone's life at risk and put anyone in danger, but we need to get the information so that we can help provide security in an area. There was a situation in the Central African Republic way back when the mission started where Blue Helmets from Pakistan couldn't speak French or any other local languages. The civilians had already come through a lot and they presumed these new non-French speaking armed men were rebel reinforcements and began violently demonstrating against them. And without a common language, the Pakistanis couldn't speak up for themselves. There are lots of stories like this. So yeah, languages are pretty important for the job. 
By now, you might be wondering, does the UN have a language school? Or have they found another way around this particular dilemma? Answers coming up. Bangladesh contributes more personnel than any other country with roughly 8,500 total members. Ethiopia contributes roughly 1,000 more troops, but fewer personnel overall. India and Pakistan also provide nearly 8,000 members each. In fact, the majority of peacekeepers come from the developing world. Over 150 countries that either participate or have participated in peacekeeping, and it breaks down into three basic categories of personnel, military, civilian, and police. So this means they already speak many different languages and come from all walks of life, and they have to all work together to complete their missions. Quite cool about Bangladesh, and it's not surprising to see so many African nations contributing peacekeepers. Africa has more than its fair share of armed conflicts. The US also provides about 80 people, and the UK about 600, but can anyone join? Well, not really. When they're not on peacekeeping missions, these guys are already members of their own national armies. And by the way, if you're enjoying this story, please like and subscribe to the channel so I can bring you more of these videos. And remember to turn on notifications as well to be sure that you hear about them. One world, many languages. How can we help the millions of people who are trapped in conflicts and who suffer enormously from wars that seem to not have an if you remember the Kosovo War of the late 90s, well, in the aftermath, everyone agreed that multilingualism was essential for peacekeeping to be effective. And so to get any job at the UN, you must have language skills, and, and two of those languages are usually non-negotiable. These two are what's called the working languages of the UN. Do you know what they are? Well, let's start with the six official languages of the UN. Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. One of these languages is more important than the others, and I'm sure you know exactly which it is. Even though uh, we are just uh, a written past of with that mission, mission in South Sudan, uh, we try to do our best uh, to develop and support this community and this country to be better in the future. Imagine hearing all these wonderful accents speaking English every day. English really is the lingua franca of the UN world, and good spoken and written English is essential no matter where you are assigned. But for the blue helmets, English is not enough, I'm afraid. In fact, when you apply for the job, don't even bother if you haven't had some language training already. At minimum, you should know English and French. That's right, French and English are the working languages, and you should be able to speak and write them quite well, because this job is no walk in the park. We also need highly qualified women and men police officers, including with French and Arabic language skills. Another thing, if you're a peacekeeper, you don't just interact with villagers and troublemakers. It's also all of those NGOs and organizations you'll work with, like UNICEF, and they're going to function in the best language for that country. For example, missions to French-speaking Africa will use French. That's places like South Sudan, Congo, Mali, while in Afghanistan, they might work in English and Arabic. Many of the agencies actually require a second UN language to even get you on the shortlist. Arabic is a big one, so if you can speak even basic Arabic, you're going to get your name higher up on that shortlist. Of course, there are many other important languages apart from these, and some non-UN languages can also be a good asset. Portuguese, Burmese, Swahili, Urdu. Let's say you're on a mission where locals don't speak any of the official UN languages. How will you talk to them? How will you prove you're interested in their country and cultures? Well, in some cultures, speaking their language means you have good reading, so at the very least, Smart peacekeepers will learn a few phrases of the local language, and come on, how hard is that? But you can't just learn any old words and hope for the best. In Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1996, peacekeepers were taught a few phrases like, don't shoot, I'm unarmed. Always a good one to start with. In Rwanda, they used English, French, and Kinyoanda. In Haiti, they had to be able to speak in French and Creole, so that meant picking up Creole on the job. They're basically using the local language as a co-language, and without that ability, they don't have much credibility. Hola y bienvenidos a LPLAC, e-learning para el personal de mantenimiento de paz de Latinoamérica y el Caribe. So, how do they do it? Well, good question, because the UN doesn't exactly have a language school, so there's a bit of resourcefulness needed. What they do have is online lessons for the six official languages, and anyone who works for the UN can sign up for these. They can take a course either at UN headquarters or on their own at home. But how good is the course for soldiers? And what did they need to learn a different language? Here's one plan that makes a lot of sense. 
The UN first tries to use units that are native to the country of the conflict. This way, they already speak the language in the same way the locals do, dialects and all. But let's say you have a Cambodian troop being sent to French Africa. Now, Cambodia is not a country when you hear French, and these guys don't know the French language at all. So what do they do? In 2022, when Cambodia was going to send peacekeeping officers on UN missions to Mali and South Sudan, they asked France to provide scholarships in France to give the Cambodians proper French language training. Brilliant idea. Get them right in there with the French. They also got help from the French army. And so 21 Cambodian women peacekeepers took a two-year French course, all women, and they got their certificates of French language proficiency at the end, which I think is awesome. Also, we are loving the fact that there are so many female peacekeepers. And when we find women, our fellow women, we feel it's important to share ideas on how we are supposed to live. And in that way, we are able to get all the information that we need from them on how we are supposed to protect them. Makes sense. And it's fantastic that some troops get these immersion opportunities. But of course, not everybody does. So bottom line, it's up to you as the applicant to learn the language you need. I've seen the African UN headquarters recruiting for language teachers of Swahili. So Swahili must be important. And if you were to apply for a job in Haiti, you'd have to be fluent in English, French and Haitian Creole. And how about this job description? Interpretation from one of the languages of Myanmar into English and vice versa. Interpretation? What's this all about? It's a job for brave people. Let's start with that. Um, I, I'm saying that a number of parliamentary colleagues who have disabilities do find it quite difficult getting around certain parts of the state, given that we're doing this refurbishment work. Strong regional accents might as well be a different language to a beginner. There was a survey conducted with experienced Bulgarian peacekeepers to find out what kind of language problems they faced on the job. 88% of these guys said their English improved a lot just by being immersed in English in the field, communicating every day in English, uh, reading and writing, also comparing notes with each other. Can you guess what made them not improve? Well, it was being surrounded by many languages and even accents, even if they were surrounded by American, Irish, Scottish and English accents. Tweed Guides, it's just been set up. It's about in its third year now, like, and we bring people over from all walks of life. Come again? Man, sometimes even us English people are mystified, but let's save that for an upcoming video. Other problems the Bangladeshi soldiers had were all the different cultures interpreting things in English in their own way, and it did not help that military people talk so much in acronyms. There's no easy way to learn English. So the main outcome was peacekeepers need the awareness of all the different English accents, including Asians, Africans, wh whoever. So before deployment, they need to be exposed to these different varieties. Can you imagine? For a successful peace op, they've got to understand. So does the UN know they need better language training for peacekeepers? Well, they do. But what kind of English do peacekeepers need? Does a certificate make you good enough? It's far more of a troublesome problem than you might think. Last time I checked, they were working on something. This book is a newish pre-deployment course. It's an intermediate level course, so the student has to already be pre-intermediate level in English. And it's especially designed for soldiers going into multilingual situations. There's a workbook and a teacher's book, and you can buy them off Amazon as well, so it seems anyone can use them. The British Council also had a peacekeeping English project for many years, and I hear they're experimenting with virtual reality language training. Let's see, where have we heard this one before? Secondly, see, see, see the nose. So ideally... A, what is this? A healthy sheep should have dry nose. See? Uh, so she's, uh, she's, she's got lung, inf lung infection. Give half of it, okay. morning and evening, okay. for three days. So this is interesting. This woman is a reporter and a translator, and she's helping the farmer to communicate his problem to an Indian peacekeeper who doesn't speak Arabic. And as it turns out, using a language assistant in the field is pretty common. Brave interpreter, if you ask me, because obviously it's not always going to be about sheep. And when the stakes are high, it's essential to understand the meaning behind the words and to use the best words you know to get the exact meaning across. Say, for example, there's a bit of religious or racial tension and the community speaks French, but not English. And the blue helmet has to get detailed and sensitive information from them, but he only knows basic French. What's he going to do? Because the more stressed out everyone is, the harder it's going to be to think of the right words. So in these kind of sensitive circumstances, an interpreter can really save the day because there's potential for dangerous misunderstanding. Naturally, it follows that the UN employs their own field interpreters for this. And these interpreters face real danger out there. So 
Sounds like another great video we've got in the pipeline. Afternoon. Afternoon. How are you? Fine, thank you. And you? I'm fine. Sit down. What of immigrating? When we were uh, of uh, from uh, six years, uh, we didn't. Uh, we can't uh, sit in our mess, stay in our mess. We go to Beirut. Good. Do you understand now? Yes. That's perfect. I love this story. When a peacekeeper from Ghana was sent to teach English to Arabic-speaking school kids in Lebanon, apparently the kids were shocked and refused to let him teach them. But after a while... 9.30 up to 12.30 hours in the afternoon. It goes the big for just one person. No more job to do. We don't have job to do all that. So you become redundant. Do you understand? Who said it? Say it! When a person is redundant from his job, uh, the boss of the job or uh, the company uh, pay uh, to him some money. They loved him and the other troops from Ghana. It happens in other places too. So what's going on here? Why would a peacekeeper teach English? Well, sometimes schools just spot an opportunity for their kids. There are all these blue helmets in town stuck with them for a while, so why not involve them? Especially if the soldiers can't speak Arabic. So the kids are forced to only speak English with them. That's how you play ball. Play, all, all play. play. That's good ball. Oh, it's raining. It's raining. It's raining. Yeah. Remember also that kids are going to run into the soldiers in town and nobody wants them to be scared. So it helps a lot if they're already used to them from school. It's quite interesting, really. And it's not only for kids. During 2020, Blue Helmets gave some women a crash course in Italian in this little Lebanese village. Also very cool. Peacekeeping missions taught me love, peace, and humanity. And if you want to also connect with the world and be a peacekeeper in your ordinary life, why not start by learning a new language? There are some great ideas in this video right over here.